Now, in that discussion, I've said to you, the legal framework says that a contractor will be issued with a document saying that he must not go above some value of peak particle velocity. And I've already said as well, peak particle velocity comes from data which were collected before 1981. So, the contracts themselves tend to say that the peak particle velocity must be measured within 30 inches of the ground, certainly less than two inches per second, and as I've said, probably 1.5 or one, comes from the US Bureau of Mines data. However, there are two other <coughs> major resources. That's the uh, Deutsche Industrie Norman, the German standard 4150, which has entered into the Euro codes, and that was based on a lot of work back in the 1920s and 30s by German railways. And there was the building research establishment, and for a short while I was the custodian of that when I worked with them in the UK. These are vast resources that tell you over a lot of years just how structures behave when they're exposed to vibration. Now I want to tell you about peak particle velocity and why it really isn't a good idea. What we have here is a diagram of the response of a single degree of freedom system. And I'm going to demonstrate a single degree of freedom system for you. This is a mass and a spring, and there is going to be damping in the system where energy is lost in the reaction with my hand or imperfect connections here. Now you'll see that at the left hand side of this diagram, at very low frequency, what we have is the system behaving like this. The system will just follow the input. Okay. As the frequency increases, we get to resonance. And the input is small, the response is bigger. Now the party piece. When we get up to high frequency, the structure will not follow the input. Not very well. Okay. So that's this diagram as we go through a resonance. This is a single degree of freedom system. All seismic instruments depend on this principle. So what we have here is in this low frequency range, that's where accelerometers work and you'll see that it's a pretty flat characteristic. So accelerometers now are our preferred instruments because they work all the way down to zero frequency and because gravity is always there, they don't even switch it off at weekends, accelerometers will respond to tilt as well. So they, they measure not just acceleration but tilt as well, which is acceleration at very close to zero frequency. These devices, which are typically seismometers, they have to operate at resonance. And look at the problem that they have. They are working through a very non-linear part of the characteristic of a seismic instrument. The reason that you need to work at resonance is down here. The phase response is at 90 degrees, which is what you want for velocity. It's at 90 degrees compared with the uh, acceleration. But then it comes down here as well. In the old days, what we did was to have geophones which had a natural frequency of 4 hertz, and they operated down to about 2 hertz, and then up to 10, something like that. That's where the data came from about peak particle velocity. But we're using it all the way up to 50 or 100 hertz, and we're trying to extrapolate downwards close to zero hertz. Don't get there, it's impossible to get there. And the way that we do it is by electronic compensation. But as you multiply this right hand side of this graph up, you will also multiply noise. So you've got a noisy signal with which you're going to analyze to look for the peak particle velocity. It's far easier to use acceleration which is a much more precise device than to use a seismometer. The seismometer has to be calibrated off-site and then taken to site and you work with the calibration. 
accelerometers, you take them to site, tilt them in Earth's gravity, and you've got the calibration automatically. So long as you're using really precise devices, then there's nothing much wrong with that.